Hello, everyone. Welcome to Honest Hour. We're going to give it just a few more minutes to let everyone trickle in. Um, definitely say hello to everyone in the chat. Um, we'll be getting started shortly, but we are in for a super fun conversation tonight with talking of different fandoms and things we love and how they, you know, help pick us up with our mental health. All right. So quick little introductions. Thank you everyone for joining us for Honest Hour. Um, I'm Amanda. I'm one of the program coordinators here at NAMI Orange County. Um, if this is your first time joining us, um, NAMI stands for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, so we have programs specifically geared for our teens and young adults in Orange County. And one way we're able to provide this all free at no cost is um, through our funding with Orange County Healthcare Agency. And one way you guys can help us continue providing programs at no cost is by taking just a few minutes at the end of this event and filling out our feedback survey. Um, you know, the survey lets us know how we're doing, um, anything you guys would like to see in the future. And so your feedback is super valuable to us and programs like Honest Hour. Um, we'll definitely be sharing that in the chat throughout this event. So if you get a chance, um, take a few minutes to fill that out. Awesome. Okay. So I think let's kind of get things going because I know we have a ton that we want to talk about tonight. Um, but first off, um, I do have one poll question. We like to do this at the beginning of every honest hour and just kind of check in with everyone and see how we are doing. So let me. Okay. Guess it's not on here. Love it. But I want you guys to write in the chat and just let me know how you guys are all feeling at this moment. Are we feeling happy, excited for this conversation? Are we feeling a little tired because it's seven o'clock? Are we hungry? Let's see how everyone is feeling. I love it, Shivani. Excited to talk about fandoms. Love it. Excited and a little hungry. I feel that. I feel that. This is definitely one of my favorite conversations. Okay, talking about all things fandom related. Feeling content, kind of hungry, and excited to share virtual space. Love it. All right, so I want to kind of start this off and get us in the headspace of talking about this diversity. Um, with it, I've got a short video that's talking about leading lady parts and what kind of goes into this casting and seeing how it how it goes. This was done three years ago, so I'm sure things are a lot. We'll talk about if things have changed or if they're still the same, but let's give this a, a look. You must be Amelia, Stacy, Felicity for the lady part. I'm Florence, reading for the leading lady part. I'm Gemma. And what did you think of it? The part? Well, I loved it. It's just a great part. I think she's great. How do you see her? She was feisty. Feisty. She's bold. <laughs> she's the one calling the shots. She's. Mm. I think she's pretty. Thank God. Clever. She's. <laughs> she's pretty clever. That's not what you're going for. Well, no. I mean, we hadn't really. No. Clever's not really something we want or care about at all, actually. You do realize this is the leading lady part. Should we have a read? It's what I've always wanted the chance to speak. All right, thank you. I'm not sure that's quite what we're after, really. Do it again, but just this time, try it a bit more smiley. You want me to smile? Yeah, just, you know, more leading lady. The scene gets quite tragic. So? I sort of thought she'd be crying. Crying? She could cry, mm. but not like ugly cry. More like sensual, sexy crying, like In wet. a shower. Shower of crying and smiling think of the poster so i've always wanted 
the chance to say. And let's stop you there. Do it again. Only this time, could you try it with a bit more makeup? I'm sorry. She's our leading lady. She's got to be peachy. If you could just. It's all I have. Maybe lose the jumper. Sorry? The jumper. And the shirt. The, the shirt, why? And the rest of it. Is that really necessary? It's the character. But she's a doctor. Yes, and it's very hot. In the hospital. In South London. Exactly. It says here that it's November. The heating's broken. NHS cuts. And she's trying to operate, but all this stuff keeps getting in the way. Her clothes. Yes, her clothes. Could we just... I'd always wanted a child. Oh, no. That was fine. I mean, fine. But could you just be a bit thinner? Thinner? Yeah, we really saw her as... Thin. Like a twiglet. Like a twiglet. Yeah, you know, feminine. Vulnerable, delicate, and thin. But with a great rack. What? Stick thin with boobs and hips. Oh, but not big hips. No, not, you know, baby bearing. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Sorry, I don't get it. I, what are you asking me to do? It's not rocket science, darling. We're just asking you to be thin and curvy, sexy and innocent. So which? <laughs> Both. You know, sexy virgin. Thin, sexy hooker virgin with boobs and hips, but not big ones. She's never had sex, but she's all about sex. She definitely wants it. Oh, she wants it. But not too much. Not too much, but a bit. Yeah, like a lot, but a bit. Just, you know, leading lady. It's okay, stop there. Is everything all right? Yeah, could you just be a bit more white? Hi, I'm Lena. It's really nice to meet you. No. Sorry? We're after leading ladies, not leading ladies' mum. <laughs> I am a leading lady. No, you're not. I am a leading lady. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Nope. Mum. Have you seen my IMDb? Yeah, you're a mum. Yeah, I've played some mums. Mum. I've played a kick-ass mum. Kick-ass mum, still a mum. But you're hot. Yeah, hot mum. Hot mum. I could get bored with that. I can hear you. Next! Next! What? And of course. Oh. Thank God. Oh, I'm gagging for a coffee. Three skinny cappuccinos. Do you want yours extra hot? Oh, I'm, I'm actually here to read. What? I'm here to audition for the leading lady. Don't get it. She seems to think she's here for the leading lady. Yeah, but she's... Look, it's not that kind of film, darling. Uh, and what kind of film is that? I know what's happened. You've been sent to the wrong room. They're auditioning for that other film. Um, what is it? Black Panther Returns. That's it. That's in the next suite. No, I'm not here to audition for Black Panther Returns. I'm here to audition for your film. Are you really not going to let me read? <sighs> Wait. If you're passing Starbucks on the way out. What are we going to do? Hmm. That first one's big on Instagram. Yeah, she's... I don't think we know. I just don't think we found the one. No. Hey! Yeah, is that it? Is that everyone? I'm afraid so. Do you think... What? Actually, I'd quite like to read it. I'm just starting out. Look at my face. Sorry. I think someone else just turned up. Let me check. <gasps> <laughs> Oh, hello. Hi, I'm Tom. 
and uh, I'm here to read for the leading lady. I'm just going to stop you there. You've got the part. Great. Hi. Yeah, yeah, it was... Oh, it's always hard to tell, isn't it? But I think I did all right. Yeah, I'm... I'm coming in with a shock. Me too. Me too. All right, so leading lady part. I think that gives such an amazing commentary on just the overall satire of how hard it is for a woman actress just to get a leading part and how many conflicting viewpoints there are. Um, you know, the more, even the more like diverse actresses that came in for the part, they were like, ooh, no, definitely not. You have to be more white. And then in the end, just giving it to a male. Um, like they can be the only ones that have that leading role. So, I mean, ridiculous. And I mean, this was done three years ago and I feel like we have made a few leaps since then, but we'll definitely be talking tonight on how far we've actually come with that. So I would love to introduce um, our amazing panel that I have joining me tonight. Um, I'm gonna throw it off to each of you to do your own um, introductions. And if you could, maybe let's kick off with a little bit of fun of what fandoms do you guys feel you're a part of or that your absolute favorites? So let's see, Shivani, do you wanna go first? Sure, awesome. Okay, so my name is Shivani. I actually work at NAMI Orange County as a um, project coordinator. Um, I also am a part-time English teacher at a couple local community colleges in Orange County. Um, my dream would be to teach like a literature of Harry Potter class one day. So um, based on that and based on my background, my biggest fandom is probably the Harry Potter series. I'm also a Star Wars fan, Lord of the Rings fan, and in this past year, um, my partner is a huge gamer and anime fan. So I've recently started getting into um, Demon Slayer. So shout out Noel for all that Nezuka stuff back there. Um, I've also started watching Attack on Titan, Jujutsu Kaisen, and um, some Studio Ghibli films, which everybody told me was definitely the, the way to start. And House, it's gonna be super obvious, but I am a Gryffindor girl through and through. Um, and I have reasons for that. I'm always thinking rashly. I never, I am horrible at making decisions. I always talk, like, act first, then think later, which uh, most Gryffindors famously do. And I am definitely someone who's always, like, first in line, ready to do something, ready to go, always the risk taker. Um, so, yeah, that's me. And I will pass it over to our... Um, guest speakers. Um, I think Justine is first on my screen, so I'll pass it over to her. Sure. Hi, y'all. I'm so excited to be here. Um, my name is Justine. I use they, them, and she, her pronouns, and I co-host uh, Fandom Femmes. Uh, basically, we, Noelle and I, who you will meet in, in a minute, um, we started this podcast um, over the pandemic. We're about to celebrate our um, our first birthday this month, actually. So we've been, um, this is a huge milestone for us. Um, and yeah, our podcast is all about um, conversations about diversity and inclusion um, in fandom and really like bringing queer femme perspectives to a lot of these uh, conversations that only happen typically in the confines of conventions. Um, as for my favorite 
<laughs> oh my gosh. As for my favorite fandoms, where to start? I'm just a I'm just a gigantic nerd. Um, I love I love comic books. Um, my favorite, I recently got back from a trip to New York and um every place that I end up traveling to, I visit a comic book shop and I buy something. Um Oh, what else is there? Wow, it's just escaping me. I I love anime, um, specifically sports anime. Um, let's talk sports anime, y'all. I love sports anime. Um, and oh, what else? What else? Yeah, I think that's that's everything like at the top of my head. But yeah, I'm like a huge um like comic book and like superhero person. Um, I'm gonna. <laughs> Noelle calling me out specifically free. Um, we'll if we have time, we'll tell the story about my gateway anime but let's popcorn it over to noelle to introduce herself hello hello i'm noelle i'm the other co-host of fandom fems um yes uh basically oh man what was i supposed to talk about hi i'm noelle um i'm a huge weeb i <laughs> i was the one that pitched um first pitched to do fandom fems with uh justine and we actually officially like met for um at rehearsals for a show at anime expo so <laughs> that just goes to show our roots um in the weebdom uh but yes i've been watching anime since i was officially like officially watching anime since i was 10 because you know we all like ah oh, pokemon or like sailor moon but we are for me, at least, I just thought they were, like, just cartoons. But, like, Naruto being so serialized was, I guess, my gateway. Um, Fandoms-wise, I'm <laughs> I, I, mostly anime. I mean, I, I love Star Wars. I also do love Lord of the Rings. And um, I am a Hufflepuff. But <laughs> uh, mostly what I, I consume um, a lot of is anime. I would say Naruto, Naruto Shippuden. Um, I'm, I know a lot about and can talk a lot about if you'd like to hear me talk a lot about it, listen to our first episode of Fandom Femmes, um, Boruto Bad. We can talk about that another time, but I agree with you. Um, but yes, I, Demon Slayer, Nezuko is my best girl and I, Anime Rex, feel free to hit us up on Fandom Femmes, um, on Instagram. We got lots of those, lots of, if you just DM us hey do you have a recommendation for an anime with great uh femme representation we got you any type of category <laughs> comics that's more of like more justine's realm i'm the anime but yes hello welcome um and we're excited to be here and to talk about our leading ladies and mental health and diversity wow Yay, I, I love this overall panel with you ladies. Um, I guess I'll give my fandoms just to be fair. Um, I'm a huge, huge Harry Potter fan, Hufflepuff too, all the way. I think I may have a little bit of Slytherin, but you know, they're besties. Um, recently, I've gotten more and more into anime, never something I watched, but my, my, my partner as well, he's super in anime, so has been introducing shows to me slowly, and now I'm just a part of it. <laughs> um, I was like Demon, Demon Slayer, My Hero Academia, Ty Attack on Titan. Oh, tear jerkers. Trying to think what else. I love me some Percy Jackson. I love Greek mythology. So that I'm super excited. I just bought the like Apollo series. I'm about to dive deep into that one. Um, gosh, what else? I love Marvel's Avengers. All of that whole realm. I keep up pretty regularly on. I'm sure there's a ton more. Um, Doctor Who, I'm a huge Doctor Who fan. I actually have a, a tattoo of a Doctor Who quote on there. Eleven is my my true doctor. Um, but yeah, I did I'm sure there's a ton more, but I love I love all things fandoms. I like to keep up with what's happening and um, excited to kind of dive into this because I know with Hollywood in general, so I think we'll start broad is we're definitely seeing more and more of this transition to trying to get more diverse cast. And I think a big part of that is definitely from, you know, actors as well as like us as fans of just trying to so like, we want to see more on the screen. We want to see more um, 
more diversity, more inclusion of, of characters, because, you know, we all have our own individuality and we love to see that portrayed on screen. So we all connect to it in a way. Um, what I would love to kind of kick off with this conversation is, you know, when you hear the word superhero, what or even like leading man after we just watched our leading ladies, um, what's the image that comes to your guys' mind? Like, what do you typically think about if you're like superhero who's coming to mind? So right off the bat, I want to say growing up, my ideal superhero type was Spider-Man. Um, I did not, because growing up, I'm sure that our other ladies can speak on this, but female superheroes, where were they? Uh, I don't know. I never saw them on TV growing up. And so for me, Peter Parker was the one superhero that I related to the most, just because he did have the alter ego of being like super smart, you know, didn't really need to be a superhero because he probably could have gotten super rich just being an awesome scientist, but um, just personality wise, um, the struggles he went through, um, and then the kind of superhero he became, um, full, full of puns, especially if you watch the old Spider-Man shows, um, that was like the typical superhero that I relate to the most. Noelle, you want to go? Hi, yeah. I mean, okay, so I, I took the prompt as like, my con like as soon as you hear the word superhero what does your brain what image forms and i'm going to be transparent it's not like i like this answer but i think of superman like that's just superhero superman like that's just you see the symbol you see the curl in his hair like <laughs> that's just like uh, the Im immediate image and you know that's just a result of how i've been socialized what has been exposed to me as a child and um, has prevailed um, since then. I mean, especially since when we are children, um, this type of media is very um, impressionable, you know, and especially when it's like, oh, action figures, oh, a superhero action figure, it's it's going to be Superman. Like, um, I, I love Spider-Man. Spider-Man's my favorite. <laughs> like, Spider-Man's my favorite, like, man hero, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> And like, I'm like, man, Superman, really? Like, I literally immediately like judged myself <laughs> as soon as I like thought of that. But that is indeed what comes to mind. Um, I would like if, you know, my son or daughter or child just, you know, their first image is like, oh, maybe it's uh, Nezuko. I don't know. <laughs> When they think of a superhero, that would be cool, you know? I definitely would want to see a shift in that. But yeah, that was what I thought. <laughs> yeah, and I think kind of building off of Noelle's answer, to be honest, like this might see this might sound very cynical, but speaking very honestly, when I hear the word superhero, a lot of the images that came to mind were um, of cis white men. Um, and that I think that's really reflective because growing up, um, shows that were um, some of the Cartoon Network shows that were super popular at the time, you know, like Justice League Unlimited and like, you know, like Batman Beyond, like all those things, like even like Static Shock. Um, when I was younger and even internalizing this as I got older, I always thought that like superheroes weren't for me because I wasn't a boy. Um, and like even at McDonald's, you know, like the they would ask you for your happy meal, like, oh, is your child a boy or a girl? And then they would give you a Barbie if you were a girl. They'd give you a Justice League character if you were a boy. Um, and I didn't really see the impact of that until I got older. Um, and and yeah, like I when we um when we like see these images and everything too, um, I think it's really um kind of building off of what Noelle was saying about the impact that it can have. Um, I think a lot of like echoing one of the main points about the importance of media representation is that when you're young, what you see on TV um, is like tells you who you can be and what is possible for you. So, for example, like um, this, like in a in a kind of chain reaction kind of thing, because I thought that superheroes were for an anime like Yu-Gi-Oh and Naruto and like everything that was on four kids TV um, <laughs> on Saturday mornings was was for boys. I didn't think that was that was a space for me. 
Um, it wasn't until my first year of college, actually, that I um, bought my first comic book because I was really afraid to take up space in that world because I was afraid that I was going to get asked like, you know, oh, yeah, you're a fan of this comic book. Like you you like Spider-Man. OK, like, do you know what happened in X, Y, Z issue? Or it's like, do you have this collectible, this collectible, this collectible? Oh, you only were. Oh, you like the the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man? That's not. No, like we don't like that in this fandom, you know, um, and all this like gatekeeping and um, of this particular fandom, like it literally, the reason why representation was also the reason why I I kind of bucked up and like stepped into this world of comics and like this area of fandom because um, the year I got into comics was the year that a comic book called Silk came out, um, where she's a um, a Korean American superhero with the same that was bitten by the same spider as Peter Parker, and um, I saw someone of Asian descent like with her own series. And I'm like, okay, well now I have to buy it, you know? And I walked into my first comic book shop and like, luckily um, it was the first comic book shop I encountered, um, like my home comic book shop, shout out to comic book hideout is owned by a woman. And she, it was, it was a shop that wasn't inherited by her like fought, like she, she didn't inherit it like from her husband or her father, she built it, you know, it's, it was her own business. And that was extremely inspiring too. And like, because of that, you know, Noelle and I created this, this, the, because of this attitude, um, we created this space that's kind of like an FU to gatekeeping, um, where we could be like, when you're here, it doesn't matter. Like you could nerd out as, in as many degrees as you want. Like you have a place in fandom femmes. Uh, that was a roundabout answer, but yes, <laughs> superheroes. <laughs> No, but it was such a fantastic answer. I think all, all of our answers, and I think that really goes to show like just where the mindset is when you think superhero, you don't think woman or person of color, you think white cis male. Um, like to me, right, I think at presently, Thor, Chris Hemsworth, that superhero right now. Um, in the past, like I grew up watching Batman on Saturday morning cartoons, and that was, you know, who embodied a superhero to me. Um, if you saw women in the show, they were the damsels in distress. They were, you know, the love interests, or they were the sidekicks even to the heroes or the villains themselves. Like they never got to be the main baddie. Um, and I, and I think you're right. Like it does really put that mindset of like, well, I can't be that. Um, but I'm loving how, you know, and I think it's from, from us being fans of being like, no, we want to see more women on the screen being the leads. I mean, I can't even tell you how excited I got when I saw Black Widow, like in that first Iron Man movie. And I was like, oh, she just owned that whole screen. And I like remember leaving the theater going so pumped, like so, so pumped to finally seeing a woman like completely kick ass on screen and not be the damsel that needed help. Um, and so with that, I think, you know, having movies like Wonder Woman, I mean, she is a strong, strong superhero, which, you know, part of Justice League that we all watched as kids, but yet was, I felt more of like the background character. Um, but now she's forefront, you know, we're seeing representation with Black Panther coming out, um, come releasing in a few at the end of this month is that um, Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings which is, I think, so monumental that we are getting a superhero and an entire cast that is uh, of Asian um, heritage. And, and I like that even like looking into this movie, because when this comic was created back, back in the day, there are some things that are very stereotypical and, and you know, not reflected well, but I love the director is, is making an effort to change those, you know, to make it appropriate, to make it not just a stereotypical movie and then it goes to waste. So I think there's a ton of themes coming up and movies coming out that are trying to showcase this more diverse cast and give more leads to people of color or, you know, women even. Um, but I still think there, you know, there's some ways that there still needs growth or that needs to be worked on. So, but I think, um, Justine, you were kind of beginning to talk about this, about how important this representation is um, for fans. So I would love to hear from like Shivani and Noelle, what you like, why this representation matters so much to, you know, all of us as fans. 
I, I think it's huge. Um, you know, Justine, while you were talking, I, I just kept thinking about, um, I put in the chat, Okoye and Black Panther. I mean, when I watched Black Panther in theaters, I was like, that chick is badass. Like, I, I don't remember coming out of the theater thinking about any other character more than I did about her. Um, and I just thought that was awesome. Like, she she just did her own thing. And the fact that she turned on her own partner because she was like, no, like, my identity means more than this relationship. And that's what I'm going to choose. I was like, yes, we love that. Love to see that in superhero movies. And then also a big break for me is the fact that um, Miss Marvel, uh, if anybody's, a, you know, a Marvel fan, Miss Marvel is a Pakistani-American uh, woman. And I'm not Pakistani, but I am Indian American. And so it is just amazing to see a Desi American coming into the superhero world. Like that's something that, you know, my future children are going to see and they're going to be like, oh my gosh, yes, I can relate to that. And not only like in Marvel, but um, just a shout out to um, Disney. So my niece the other day, she's watching Mirror of the Royal Detective on Disney and this is the first time that I've ever seen, you know, a Desi American led show. And my niece comes to me and she's like, Shibumasi, which basically means like Aunt Shivani in Hindi. Um, she was like, Shibumasi, I just wanted to tell you that there is a Princess Shivani on Mira, the Royal, the Royal Detective. And she kind of looks like you too. And I was like, that's so awesome. I've, I never would have thought growing up or even with my own family, like, that my niece, my nephews, like, you know, this upcoming generation would be able to see on screen someone that looks like them and now associates those images with like positive role models, right? Like seeing a princess and being like, oh yeah, that looks like someone I know and someone I look up to or that superhero who is strong and independent. And yes, while she does, while she is loyal to a king, she does do her own thing and she is an independent person, you know, and her identity is not just you know, second in command, you know, female boss, but like, she's her own awesome character. And I think that's so, so awesome to have in this, like, this new generation. It's, it's just awesome to see and witness. Sorry, I lost my mouse for a bit. Um, <laughs> I was like, where is my cursor? Uh, anywho, yeah, uh, Man, for me, like representation, I feel like would have been really helpful for me to better tap into, I guess, my the strength of my femininity earlier on. I feel like um, I I say this in our podcast all the time. I grew up a huge tomboy. I like rejected. I like rejected all things girly. I was like, that's not me. I'm going to wear my Tony Hawk long sleeve shirt and my beanie. Like I was like, I was like super. And I feel like that was because um, I, I always, I was an only child. So I wasn't really trying to compete with anybody, but it was like, I always felt like I wanted to be like in charge of like my life. That sounds really deep for a child, but like, <laughs> But like I, um, and the thing is, is that the, the, the media that I consumed, it always tended to be those who had power, those who had control uh, over or of their destiny or fates were men, right? And they had more masculine tendencies, features, obviously. And so I guess that was me as a child trying to emulate that. And I feel like if I had more um, femme role models that sh could show me, you know, there's strength in in being a woman you know there's strength in being a femme um and we can do those things too maybe i wouldn't have so deeply rejected <laughs> all of that um i mean that's a journey in itself and we've definitely talked about it on our podcast but say for example um now in the realm of um colorism uh I, the closest i had to like a, a female female hero or femme hero growing up was like mulan um, I definitely like, I was like, oh man, she's so badass and like, and she's like, Asian, you know? Um, but then I remember dressing up as Mulan for Halloween for elementary school one time and people telling me, you're too brown to be Mulan. 
you're not Mulan. And I'm like, I can do a kick. Look at me. Uh, but they're like, you can't be Mulan. You're not Chinese. I'm Filipino. And um, right now, because of pandemic, I'm very light, but I'm also Ilocano, which is a region of the Philippines where like we like we I normally am much darker. <laughs> but so growing up, yeah, I played in the sun a lot as a kid, lots of melanin. Um, and yeah, people were just like, you can't like not that you can't like Mulan, but like you can't be Mulan. So there was like a disassociation there. And so even more so like um, that's why it's great to see something like Raya um, or even Moana. I feel like, um, yeah, they're not specifically Filipino, but to see a girl on screen that is melanated. And <laughs> um, so like someone like my, my future children, or if I had a daughter, like to be like, oh, wow, like, I could be a badass too because Moana did it, you know, like even just seeing that, you know, even at that point, they don't understand like, oh, that person is not specifically Filipino, but they look like me, you know. So I feel like these um, this progression is definitely like important. There's definitely so much more to work on in terms of like direct representation um, because a lot of things tend to be a little more generalized, um, put in a vacuum, but uh that's that's a law. That's a long conversation. We actually talk about it on Fandom Femmes. We talk about Rye the Last Dragon. So feel free to check it out and hear what our opinion is on it. But yeah, that's that's my take. Definitely need to catch up on that episode because Rye and the Last Dragon was oh, talk about a movie that's gonna make you cry like sixteen times throughout the entire film. Such a good one though. But I, I love that there's more of that representation happening within movies that, you know, we would watch as adults, as well as like movies for kids. And now kids are getting a chance to actually see these characters on screen and see like, you can be just like them. You have the power to be like them as well. You are just as strong as anyone else. And that's, it's amazingly important to have. Um, but one point you brought up is how sometimes it's generalized. It's not specific. And I think that is one negative to Hollywood where yes, they need to show diversity, but yet we're still not quite there yet in terms of having fully developed characters of color um, or even, you know, having having stronger backstories or positive backstories. Like why do we always have to be tragic? Um, so I know I, I do want to kind of get all of your guys' opinions on, you know, when it comes to this diversity in Hollywood, what do you think most people in this industry do get wrong? Um, I can start. Oh, Shivani, you can go first. Oh, okay. Um, I think, okay, so Amanda kind of alluded to it. Um, like a little bit, but I can elaborate with like some examples and everything like that. Um, so I think one thing that Hollywood gets wrong and like even like media kind of gets wrong is um, people see like affinity groups or identities as like a box that they check um, rather than, and, um, and if they do check that box, they tend to um, hone in on the the difference or like the trauma um, of that specific identity. Um, I was talking to Amanda about this the other day, but like I have so much frustration, like as in as a non-binary person, as an LGBTQ plus person, I'm sick and tired of seeing the only LGBTQ plus stories out there be about you know, a family disowning them, being about like um, mental health issues, being about bullying and isolation. Um, what I would like to see more of is characters who just so happen to be non-binary or just so happen to be gay um, or like just so happen to be like a person of color. Um, but the, and the focus, that's a part of who they are, but that's not the the reason why they're why they're in the um why they're in the piece i'm kind of building off on that too while we were talking about like raya the last dragon we we um elaborate more on this like in the podcast as well but um i i really i i really do appreciate that all these opportunities are like you know i had friends kind of like what you were 
uh, what you said earlier, Shivani, like really reminded me of this. But when Raya came out, I had people saying like, oh my God, you like, you could, t- you should totally cosplay Raya. Like I can see it. You should totally do it. And um, th- that's, that's wonderful. And I know Disney for that movie took a lot of care to research like Southeast Asian influences, um, you know, source like Southeast Asian identified like writers um, and like designers to build the world of Raya the Last Dragon. Um, I was I was really disappointed to find out that a lot of the people they casted are East Asian and only three people in the voice cast were um, were Southeast Asian, um, even though a lot of the um, the influences were pulled from Southeast Asia. So even though baby steps are made, um, I I really hope that these like large corporations are going to see like, okay, like for me, what, what, what seeing that meant was, okay, cool. Like we're going to give you this diversity inspired by Southeast Asia, but we still like cast it by casting an East Asian voice cast to me that read like, okay, we know what boxes to check to get Southeast Asian people to show up, but we still see Asian, the Asian community as a conglomerate, um, you know? So like, yeah. And so we can cast like, as long as they're identified as Asian, whatever that means, like we can put them in. Um, but yeah, I think another thing that I, I want to mention like super fast that they get wrong. And like, I would love to um, actually like invite our, um, the folks who work at NAMI who are on this panel to um, to elaborate on this a bit more, maybe like after everybody goes, but um, something that has really upset me is um, also portrayals of, of mental health in, um, in media as well. I've seen, like the glamorization of you know mental health breaks and like people who are neurodivergent you know i've seen that glamorization i've also seen like dissociative identity disorder used to villainize a lot of the characters um in in horror movies you know so i think there's still and exploring like so i think while you know like poc representation is one thing i think the intersections of the issues and experiences of these different communities also need um, light as well. And that means getting more people um, with diverse identities in the writer's room and in positions of power. So to green light and fund these productions, because honestly, like at this point right now, it's almost like if the community isn't funding it, it's not going to happen. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my two cents. <laughs> Awesome. I, so I want to jump on two really good points that you brought up, Justine. And so the first one was talking about LGBT representation in media. And one thing that I um, recently watched, I don't know if anybody here watches Never Have I Ever, but it's Mindy Kaling's new show on Netflix. And there's one character um, who I, as I started talking, I literally forgot her name, but um, she is one of Davy's best friends. And in the first season, it's revealed that she, um, is a lesbian and she ends up getting a girlfriend and um in the second season they get a little bit more screen time and what i thought was really important were scenes that really depicted the way that she was trying to fit into this this new you know expectations as a lesbian let's let's say that right and this idea that she had to act a certain way she had to like certain things in order to be the right kind of lesbian when, um, you know, later on it's revealed that her girlfriend was saying, ended up saying like, I don't really care that you don't like some of those things. And it doesn't mean that you're not a lesbian. It just means that you're different, right? And whether or how you present yourself has nothing to do with your identity as someone in the LGBTQ community, um, which I thought was really important to say. And of course, I hope that they further that conversation in the show and they depict it a little bit more, but, um, Yes, exactly. Imposter syndrome. So, so important to touch upon that. And then the other thing that you brought up, which I think is super important, is the villainization of mental illnesses. And I feel like lately we've seen that so much in mainstream media. And for me, the first thing that pops up is like the Joker movie, right? And like uh, how they just, I mean, it, it took it from one end of a spectrum to another. And um, I just remember being on like, um, forum communities like uh, Reddit and things like that. And remember being like terrified to go to the movies because people were saying that they were going to use, um, 
their mental illnesses to maybe shoot up a movie theater. And it's like, no, 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 that's not the message that this movie was trying to send. And that's definitely not the message that we want um, those who may be going through a mental health crisis to see, right? That their, that their mental illness is not being seen as, um, you know, something negative. It's not seen as, oh, this is gonna be a gateway into you committing a crime and that the two are not related, but um, it's so unfortunate that that's how Hollywood puts them together. It's like they have a mental illness, thus they are villains in this movie. And those two are directly related when it's it's so much more complex than that. And that should not have been the only takeaway from the Joker movie. But um, I think that there's definitely a lot more uh, work to be done in that field when it comes to the intersection between mental health and uh, movie depictions. Oh, wow. That's hard to follow up. So many great points. <laughs> um, oh, man. Okay, so I actually, um, I graduated with a degree in film and TV production. So I had to learn, you know, the entire process, pre-production, production, post-production. Post um, oh, my gosh. Distribution. <laughs> okay, and so essentially, yeah, you can, um, but what everything comes down to, like, uh, Justine said is funding so like essentially like what we see on big screens or even like on television or what's chosen to even stream on Disney plus um, it's all put through this funnel of which show which movie is going to make us the most money and what's a way to make more money is to make sure that the audience it's is bigger, aka it can um, accommodate uh, the mass population, right? So, uh, and what's sad about that um, in terms of the lack of diversity is that they don't consider, well, like they consider like what the mass population wants is like white cis males or even white, white cis women on the screen because from the advent of movies and television, that's what everyone was seeing because that's how that started um, and in the history of filmmaking. So um, I hope like, oh man, I'm getting really film nerdy right now, but... <laughs> Uh, so essentially, like it's exactly what Justine said, is uh, we, what we would need is more people in the industry. We need more executive producers. We need um, more people in the studio that are just the big wigs that are for us, um, for the minorities, for the LGBTQ community, for women and femmes. And that's hard because it's there's so many political things in that sense where like these people um, and a lot of them are like old people that have been in the industry for so long that they're like, no, that's not going to fly. And uh, like we saw in leading lady, like even um, like those tropes of what they needed for the leading lady, like you can't be old, but you have to be sexy, but you have to be innocent. Like these are all like old values um, that were like, uh, I guess, cemented uh, when like filmmaking first started, which was like in the 1900s. Uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty wild uh, of how that is. And I feel like, like, say, for example, um, I, I feel like aside from having more POC and LGBTQ people and femmes in those positions, we also need more allies. Um, so... <laughs> We said this in Fandom Femmes about rich white men, <laughs> help us out. <laughs> we hope that, you, you know, it's it's like um, we're, we're hoping that, you know, as we can, as a community continue to fight for this, we hope to also like continue to educate our allies, um, even if that's just the people around us. We don't know like what the people around us um, may have connections to. Maybe they'll end up calling out someone that's an executive producer and be like, hey, that's kind of racist. You shouldn't put that in your script or you shouldn't let that fly. You know, like we never know. As long as we're continuing as a community to be pushing and educating, I feel like that's something that we should really continue doing. And I feel like people kind of don't really think that educating, even in a social sense is is doesn't do much but like where else what else can we do like not all of us are rich 
and white. <laughs> so um, it's like uh, we have to do what we can, you know. And then also I feel like what people in the industry do wrong is like they continue. Like they're like, oh, yeah, let's cast a black person for this role. Let's cast an Asian person for this role. But for some reason, they continue to use toxic tropes you know, like the, the, the flags to show, yes, even though you can visually see that they're black or Asian or Hispanic, let's make sure to show that they like fried chicken. Let's make sure to show that, you know, they have an accent, like that's very prevalent, you know, let's make sure to show that, you know, on the side, they do like yard work, you know, like for some reason, why, 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 why? Like, why does it have to be that way? It do- it really doesn't have to. Like, they can literally just be like, oh, you know, like, they can talk about, like, you can, in script writing, like, uh, screenwriting, you literally just say, like, in a line, like, all they have to say is like, oh, my tío, you know, like, then you're like, oh, they're Hispanic, you know, like, and then that's it. You don't have to sh- have anything else contextual, like, people overdo it with the tropes, like, it, it doesn't need to happen, like, it it doesn't. And even an example would be like um, Kim's Convenience. I don't know if anyone knows that series on Netflix. There is this huge um, deal where I, the, I'm forgetting the actress's name, but the mom, um, like Kim's wife, uh, tweeted about basically how they, the actors and actresses would have fights with like the, the, the director, the producer, because they were, would make them they would read the script and be like this is not we don't do this in korean american culture we don't do this at all like this is not they're like oh but we wrote it so do it and they're just like no like i'm not gonna do that and i'm glad that there is like there are you know actors that are willing to speak up um because for i mean for the longest like I feel like a lot of even Asians or even just people of color or any of these type of roles were just like, oh, we're lucky to even just have it, you know? And it's sad to think that like, you know, we're, we're like in that type of position um, for especially American movies where it's just like, oh shoot, like I got cast in this movie. Like I just, I'm gonna do what they say, you know? So yeah, um, that was a lot. I got a little nerdy, but we're okay. Uh, so that's kind of what I think. There's so many other things, but there's so much to work on, and hopefully, um, we can continue educating uh, and hopefully gain allyship from the big wigs somehow. Yes, so so much of all three of your answers with that. I mean, so true. I think you know needs the funding in order to progress it further. We need more more individuals behind the scenes, like writers who are of different ethnicities. I mean, and even like what you're saying, you know, we have to show these tropes to really hone in the point that they're different is we don't need to do that. It, it really doesn't give any value to, and substance to these characters anymore. I mean, I think, you know, I, I feel like maybe there's a bit of that difference too between like when you're reading source material versus what you're visually seeing on screen, you know, I think authors have the luxury of they can be a bit more vague with their characters or they can only give a few details, but then it leads up to your imagination to like paint what this character looks like where our, our movies are like, nope, this is what they look like. And we'll give you some, some of those tropes just to play it up even more um, or to check off our, our box of, we had someone from LGBTQ or we had a a woman in here. Um, But what I, what I love has kind of come out of people examining these movies is there's really, there's one test, but they have now enhanced it to multiple. So that's that, um, the Bechtel test. So this originally is more for women in films and it was, it was to measure their representation in fiction. And so the test that you do is you you watch a movie, read a book, and they need to have at least two um, named women characters. So just not someone hanging out in the background. They have to be named and they have to talk to each other. And during that conversation, they must talk about something besides a man. And like seeing the number of films that it like immediately get canceled out is really sad where you you really don't think of it where you're like, wow, yeah, nope, that didn't pass the test at all. 
Um, there is a website where you can pull up the Bechdel test and it'll show you all the movies that it actually passes. Um, surprisingly not as big of a list as I thought I was, I was expecting. But now with, you know, I think this overall call to change Hollywood um, and the current themes that they're going in, they have the race Bechdel test, which follows the same three parameters. You need to have more than one character of color. They need to um, have these two characters in a conversation, and it has to be about something other than the white person in the movie. And I feel like that's an even even harder one to pass that test at, at this given moment. I mean, most of these, I feel like with movies, like especially back in the 90s, those rom-coms, they would you know have the spoofs of like our token black person. Um, where they have one line or, or two lines throughout the whole movie and, and there's no real substance, but they're there for that representation value. Um, so I think I think those are really great lenses to look when we watch these movies or watch these TV shows and really see, like, does it pass that test? Um, I, we do. I have a clip. Uh, words zumbling. Um, I have a quick clip. Uh, this guy on YouTube has put together um, every single word. Um, spoken by a person of color in films. And I found one from the very first Lord of the Rings movie. And I never like thought of it before because like, yes, this came out in what, like early 2000s? Um, been a long hot minute since I've seen it, but really seeing just how, how quick this clip is, is really eye-opening. So let me get that pulled up or... All right. I don't know. I didn't have sound on my end, but it was over in a flash. Let me do Thank that you. one more time. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> you got to get the audio. <laughs> Here we go. So that was it. He had two lines, <laughs> just repeated. <laughs> that was it. It doesn't get better. I, I will say, I think the third movie has no lines. Um, the, the second had, had a bit more, but not, not any more than just they were, they were warriors in the orc army. Um, if you, we'll put the link to that YouTube channel, but they have, I mean, a, a plethora of some of our favorite like fandom films and their short clips. It will not take you long to get through all of them, which is pretty, pretty shocking because it's not something I think we realize as we're watching these movies or watching these films. But when it's condensed down like that, it's it's not even a substantial line. Go for it, Justine. Yeah, I really um, thank you for showing that clip. Um, I um, something that came up for me as I was watching that too, that also came to mind is that more often than not and like if y'all haven't noticed this already like when when my eyes got open to this fact too oh my god like it really changed the way i watch movies but a lot of the times when people of color or people from historically represented com underrepresented communities are cast in movies um or they are a key point um or they are like a, the main character or something they're cast as like for example an orc where you can't you they have so much paint and makeup on that you can't tell that this is a person of color um additionally there's also the trope of people of color in movies turning into animals for and being an animal for like 90 percent of the movie like for example like princess and the frog is the first thing that comes to mind emperor's new groove is another thing that comes to mind too yeah so like even though we like this diversity is somewhat like celebrated and like yeah like princess tiana was like a huge step for like disney princesses too i'm not um i'm not denying that but like 
if she's being celebrated of being this like representation of a like melanated black princess, but in the same vein, we don't see her blackness for, for a lot of the movie. We, she's a frog for most of the movie. Um, so, so that's like, um, so that's something that's like coming to mind right now for me too. Um, yeah. And, and also on, in the same vein as the Bechdel test and like also the, I didn't know about like the, the race version of that. Um, yeah. but, and that was really cool to, to find out, but it also just made me think about like the bar is so low and yet so many movies fail that test, you know? And like, yeah, yeah we, I we need to do better. <laughs> So much. And I and I, the the race version of this is something definitely newer. Um, it came about as I was researching for for this conversation. And and it made me go even towards uh, you know, I, my beloved Harry Potter. I mean, I was looking up things and didn't even realize that for like the first five movies, Lavender Brown was played by a black actress. I don't think she had a line. Um, probably very few, but if you look it up, that's who is is credited as playing Lavender Brown. And then by the sixth book, when you know she becomes a thing and dates one of the uh, dates Ron, she all of a sudden becomes a white actress and is given all those lines. And you know, I I do know there there's definitely some where they're like, oh, she quit, and we just you know happened to hire this one instead. But it's like if you set up a character as one way, I mean, keep it going. I you know I think it looks even worse. Of well, now this character has more than a line or is just sitting in the background. Let's let's change it. Which yes, I'm seeing yeah Rowling. I yes, we we've got a lot. I mean, even with the glancing over character backgrounds. We all got Dumbledore that we're a little upset with, with Fantastic Beasts. I mean, hey, can't give us a nugget of like, he's LGBTQ and then not play on it. Let's just keep hushing it. <laughs> like, no, we love this. Um, so I think it's definitely something as you're like watching this, these media, like keep that in the back of your mind, that lens of like, how well is it actually doing? Um, but I'm, yeah. Uh, just to go off of that Harry Potter lens, um, just to, one of the, so in Harry Potter, one of the only creatures um, that talks is uh, Ferenc, who's um, a, a centaur, who is famously half man, half horse, and he is played by a black actor. And I was like, but why? Like, why, you know, why? <laughs> why was that the only choice? And um, it's interesting because all the characters of uh, color in the Harry Potter series, um, maybe get a couple lines. So you have the one character in um, like Prisoner of Azkaban, he's a black student and he, the only line in the entire seven movies he has is trying to catch Sirius Black is like trying to catch smoke. You can't do it with your bare hands, something like that. And that's his only line. on like ominous character ever and just thrown in there to give those like deep lines the creepy lines line. yeah. yeah and then i think he also says like um the grim uh, the grim is like it's a sign that you're gonna die but those are his only lines are like dark these dark creepy lines i'm like but why did it have to be him like that's so random and he wasn't named <laughs> he wasn't named he didn't even get a name how sad is that and i will never forgive warner brothers for what they did to the patel sisters that was just I'm sorry, but like anybody who's ever been to any kind of Indian or just Desi party in general, if you've seen how Indian women dress at those parties, the outfits that the Patel sisters wore were like the most awful representation of like Desi culture I've ever seen in mainstream media. Um, and them too, I think in, in the movies, the only lines that, um, that they get are just like, hi, Harry in the fourth movie and that's it. And then they're never seen or heard from again besides that like specific movie, which um, which is really sad. And um, one thing that I do remember and I was super excited was when Cursed Child came out um, and they started casting for those roles, they ended up casting a black actress as Hermione. And I remember how excited I was because um, it's true in the books, they don't really say what race Hermione is. I think all they say is that she has a bossy personality, she's got curly hair, and she's super smart. And that's it. And so I remember seeing all these comments about, well, no, Hermione should be white. Emma Watson is like the Hermione. 
it's like, well, not really though. Hermione could definitely be anything she wants because there's actually nowhere in the books does it say Hermione is white. So I thought that was one positive that I saw come from the series. But yeah, definitely a lot of negatives coming from the film portrayals, um, which is unfortunate because when you look at these series that we're in love with, right, whether it's Harry Potter, whether it's Lord of the Rings, whether it's Percy Jackson or whatever the case may be, when you read these books, nowhere does it say anything about race, right? So growing up and reading these, we can imagine whoever we want to be these characters. We can imagine ourselves as these characters um, because most, most authors generally don't give um, a race. Maybe they give hair color. Maybe they give something like, uh, oh, this character wears glasses or something like that. But other than that, um, it's just, it's unfortunate to see the way that Hollywood takes these characters and warps them into a, a certain cookie cutter image that we've all grown up with. Definitely. I think that's always the sad part is when, you know, we're fans and, and for a lot of us, yes, maybe some of us have only seen the movies and that's our only reference point. Or you have us that have read the books, grown up with it or read the comics. And so we know that background. Um, and and then you see these characters come to life on screen and you're like, well, you took all the personality out of him. Like, I don't care what you look like. You just took all my personality away. I, I will go back to my Harry Potter. They did Ron Weasley a disjustice. He is so much more snarkier. Even Harry was snarky and they like watered him down. And you're like, hey, but coming up with, you know, even like them changing, casting a black actress in the play. I mean, that was so brilliant. And you know what? She was probably the best choice for that role. So who cares? You know, there is no reference point of of who Hermione is, because you're right. It was just bushy hair, big teeth. That was it. <laughs> that was all the description we got. Um, she was short. I think that was the other little tidbit. Um, and as long as that personality and the light of the character is there, I think that is all that really, truly matters. Us is like our fan community. Um, Oh no, am I freezing? <laughs> my thing said unstable. <laughs> um, but segueing us into that, I think like when you go to these big conventions, you're seeing a huge, huge diverse amount of people in this space and we're all dressing up in our own way. So some, you know, are probably on point. They took the source material and that's what they are. Some of us take it as these are the guidelines, but we love and we connect with these characters. And I think that's such a highlight of our fandom communities is I think we recognize some of these shortcomings and there's definitely sources out there that are trying to fix it as best we can. I mean, our series like Harry Potter, there is a whole fandom group um, called Black Girls Create you know, they offer it as for fan fiction writers to submit their stories of their own Hogwarts characters that are of color, that all have different backgrounds. And you get to bring that character alive. You say what they did during their whole time at Hogwarts. And I think things like that are just so valuable to give different insight um, that we need more of that. Like, I think that's where like us as fans and in this fandom community can really help push it more forward of we need more inclusion and we need greater diversity. And so, yes, we're something like Harry Potter. It's never going to be rewritten. Um, you know, we'll be lucky. I know we're saying like remake for the Harry Potter movies. We'll be we'll be real lucky if anything like that ever does happen. Um, but I think us as fans, like we're we're giving more content. We're bringing these stories that we love to life and and creating new characters to fit that. Um, so as we're kind of talking about us in these fandom communities. You know, I, I want to kind of dive into the different ways we express our love for this content and what are some ways we can make it more inclusive. So I know, you know, Shivani is a fan fiction writer. I personally, I, I love to cosplay. I am no means like one of those top status. I can do everything. I can't sew. I'm terrible at it. I broke scissors trying to do it the last time and I ended up buying the costume on Amazon. But, you know, I feel like when I personally, like I love to cosplay, it's how I show I really truly connect with these characters. Um, I'm usually cosplaying characters that, you know, I, I relate to in some way. You know, I like, I feel like Harley Quinn was my, my one, my youth, probably because I was, you know, in 
dating, the toxic dating things. And so I felt like I connected with that character because it was like, yeah, like my life's crazy right now and I can't handle anything. And, you know, and, and, and I feel like we find those pieces in us or even that she's just doesn't care what other people think. And I think I really loved that because I cared so much, whatever, what everyone thought. Um, nowadays, I, I cosplay more anime characters, but I feel disconnected from females represented in anime where I feel like they're sometimes not always portrayed as as just as strong as the males are. So I typically, because I'm pretty feminine myself, I gender bend. I love, love, love doing that. Um, so a lot of characters I do, like I've done, I've done the doctor, I've done um, Todoroki, um, but very like gender bent in dresses, long hair. And this is my female version of these characters that I just love um, so, so much. So I know for me, that's, that's definitely my, my way into this fandom base. Um, and I want to hear what you guys with the podcasting as well. Um, what, are, what, what are some ways like you guys express your love of these fandoms? I could go. <laughs> I mean, I, um, I guess I surround myself with it, as you can see. Um, I mean, I have, I mean, I also a big gamer, so I like video game stuff. Um, I, I'm a big person on like customizing uh, everything about my life, um, whether it's on like the clothes that I wear on my walls. Um, I have a pin collection over here. Um, but yeah, for me, I mean, I, I I actually thought about this the other day when I was driving and I was like, like, oh man, I love wearing um, like not even, it doesn't even have to be subtle, but sometimes it is subtle. Sometimes I'll be wearing like Tanjiro's earrings or something. And then someone on the street is like, oh, I love your earrings. And I'm like, oh, we're friends now. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> You know, like you just like being able to find community like that just from wearing something. And um, like I literally made like four friends yesterday because <laughs> I was um, I forgot what I was wearing. But I also have a, a Naruto tattoo here. It's on my body forever. <laughs> um, but yeah, other than that, I I also cosplay. I love cosplaying. Um, I I like I mean, I watch anime with friends on online as well. So, um, but yes, I like supporting artists. I'm not, I can't draw. Um, so, but I love to support artists, friends that are, you know, um, drawing what they love, what fandoms they love as well. But yes. Oh, I also read a lot of webtoons. <laughs> Um, and I love talking about that with, with the friends. Um, and I know there, there's some, um, places and communities that are on discord as well, where you literally just geek out. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of how I like to celebrate it. I also like to celebrate it on our podcast <laughs> on Fandom Femmes. It's when me and Justine get to geek out and it's recorded. <laughs> um, ah, it's a fun time, but Yes, that's that's essentially um, how I like to celebrate anime um, and other fandoms. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think something that comes to mind as far as like um, expression goes, I can I can do something more like internal and then like external so internally um kind of calling back to what we were saying before about like if you want your comics your favorite comic to stick around you need to consume it like you need to it's it's very unfortunate i know that like money the fact that money is is tied to to representation and everything like that but like like that's a fact i remember one of my favorite one of my favorite animated series of all time is Young Justice. Um, if you all haven't watched it, please, please watch it. It's amazing. Um, basically like a bunch of like D the DC superheroes protege is like living life and like being teenagers and fighting crime. It's amazing. Um, but there was a time where it was discontinued. Um, when it was originally airing, it got discontinued. Um, and um, what's it called? It got discontinued because the toys weren't selling well. Um, but it ended up on Netflix and there was a whole like hashtag, like binge young justice on Netflix. Um, because if Netflix saw that people were, um, were watching it and consuming it, then they would, the hope was to green light a season three. 
Um, and literally I remember every chance I could, I would like, wow, I'm low key exposing myself, but I would fall asleep to like young justice playing in the background. Um, <laughs> I, um, when I got my wisdom teeth taken out, there was Netflix, like on the dentist chair. And then they're like, what do you want to watch? I'm just like, can you put on young justice? And I watched it while my wisdom teeth were getting taken out. So that's one way that I like express my, my, my love for fandom. And I think, um, echoing what, what Noelle said, just kind of leaving like little clues or breadcrumbs to tell the, to, um, to tell the world that I am in fact a nerd because, um, what's, what's amazing. And like what we've seen, I mean, like mine and Noelle's friendship is, um, is an amazing example. And this being on this panel is an amazing example of how putting your yourself out there, letting your nerd flag fly can bring people to you with similar interests and like build a community. And, and like, that's so wonderful. I was telling Amanda that I've looked up to Nami's work, like as a civilian for a while. Um, and I, I really love that the work that y'all do. So it was a huge honor that y'all found our podcast and reached out to us to be a part of this because, um, and that, that these types of conversations are happening. Um, with that being said, I definitely think that there also needs, there, there can be, there is more work that needs to be done to make these communities feel more like communities. Again, like what I was saying, you know, like gatekeeping and learning how um to like be an ally learning how to like spot like to intervene when you see something going wrong to like um check in on each other you know what I mean because we're already united under this umbrella of like fans of xyz thing um think of how unstoppable we could be if we knew how to like be down for each other and like you know it's it's amazing like justice league who Fantastic Four who, Avengers who, we, we're, we're, we're a bunch of, or a community of nerds who care about each other and know how to stand up for each other. So, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, and, and going off of what you said about bringing people together, for me, um, I really feel like I show my love for fandoms by just the things I do. So Amanda mentioned, I'm a fan fiction writer. I started writing fan fictions when I was like in the seventh grade. Do you guys remember the, the website Quizilla? Like that, that like throwback, there used to be like a bunch of like random like Harry Potter quizzes on there. And then you could actually post little stories. And I remember like reading this one about Remus Lupin and Sirius Black being in a relationship. And I was like, what is this? Like, I've never seen this in my life. And I remember thinking, did I miss something in the books? Like what? what are what is how is this happening and then I ended up delving deeper and finding this like whole world of people from all around the world creating these like niche like niches and, and stories and like all this really interesting stuff and finally there was a place for like queer Harry Potter fans to be there was a place for like you know people of color to be in the Harry Potter community. And I remember going from fan fiction to doing like online role plays. If you guys remember like being on forums, like um, Envision Free and like all those stuff. And it, and I remember the first time I did a role play, it was like you, you, you would pick a character, you would embody that character and you would usually use like an actor or model to be that character. And for the first time, I get to see a Black Harry Potter. I get to see, like, um, the most amazing one was I saw someone was role-playing as um, George Weasley and Angelina Johnson's kid. And so it was like Fred Weasley II. And they found a model who was both Black and Ginger. And I was like, wow, representation. I love that. And they got to be that character and just... So it's just awesome to be in these communities. Um, and yeah, we love being supportive and, and trying to, you know, take away those, those negative comments. There is, um, I never used to really be into cosplaying because I mean, to be honest, I didn't really feel like I fit a lot of characters. We've talked about this before. You know, I am brown. Most female characters represented in media tend to be white. Um, and I ended up following this um, cosplay couple named Ikosu. And um, the girl, uh, her name is Sheila, she is darker skinned. And I remember she was talking about how she like buys foundations that are like 
10 shades lighter than what she actually is and feeling so it's upset about that because I remember thinking like I wanted to be her because I thought she was so beautiful but here she is trying to emulate these other uh, typical media representations and I thought like that's awful like that she has to do that um so it's just now being able to like see more people of color um saying you know screw it all I'm going to be the character no matter what color they are and no matter what color I am because I just like this character and um like Amanda said sometimes you connect with them not by the way they look but by the way they act and um who they are as individuals and so when it comes to that level of connection it doesn't matter what you look like if you want to be that character then be that character um and so I I remember the first time I like started cosplaying. I used to do the same thing. I would gender bend characters. I think one time I dressed up as like Dumbledore because in that way I got to like hide my body, hide my skin color because I could just throw on this like really crazy costume and because I wasn't comfortable with, with the way I looked. But over time I got to feel a little bit more comfortable by seeing, you know, these me these representations um, of unique cosplayers on like social media, on TikTok, Instagram. Um, Facebook groups, whatever it might be. And now I do feel comfortable cosplaying as like Diva from Overwatch, even though she is white. Who cares? I can still be Diva, right? Um, and so in that way, it's just nice to be a part of these like different communities with so many different people who are now speaking up about their experiences and the way that they connect to these characters, regardless of the way they look. So um, it's just, it just feels good, you know, to be part of these communities and um, and I love that we have podcasts like these now, like your guys's, where you guys get to talk about all these, you know, different perspectives, you know, like queer femmes, why don't we talk about this more often? Um, so it's just so cool that we get to have all these unique and awesome perspectives on these typical tropes. Yes, I, I think as fans, we've, we've definitely gone out of our way to create a lot of spaces where we can highlight ourselves in the work of art that we love or in the source material that we love. You know, having places like DeviantArt where you can post your unique drawings or, you know, fanfiction.net and you can create any story you want and post it up there. Um, have our podcast where we can talk about what we want to talk about in regards to these fandoms that we love and even like critique it with love. We still love them, but there's some things they can sometimes do better. And, and we recognize it and we say, hey, like, we see it, but we still love it. And here's how we can possibly fix it for future generations. I mean, I do definitely see the change coming with, you know, kids programming, showing, you know, starting that trend of having awesome, strong female characters being the superheroes or showing more people of color or showing LGBTQ and it's starting and, and definitely has a bit more to go. Even like within going to like conventions, like Noelle was saying, I think within these groups, we are supportive of one another. Like we are here to uplift one another as much as we can. Um, yes, we do sometimes run into that gatekeeping or I feel like as a woman, sometimes you have to prove you're a fan. Um, but I love that there is a community where you're wearing something out of a fandom someone else loves and you connect with it and you go, hey, yes, I'm here for you. Like. I, I totally get where you're at. Let's just talk for hours about this show. And it makes it very easy and approachable, um, I think, for people to to get into these. And I, I always do find that as a nice thing with um, certain like conventions where it's just you're in a room full of people into the same things you are and you're just walking around going, you look awesome. Like, I love it. Like, let's talk about this show more and more. Um, but I do, we are wrapping up because gosh, guys, an hour and a half already like went by. I don't know what happened. I could talk for more hours on this, right? Um, but I do want to end us on this amazing question that Justine um, asked us. And what do we say? I'm Dungeon Dragons, wait for it. Keep the conversation going. I know. I think we may need to just do this again. I mean, this has been, this has been not enough time to talk about everything. Um, but we did have um, Justine, she threw at me yesterday this amazing, amazing question that they talked about on their podcast. And it was, if you could radically reimagine Comic-Cons, you know, what 
would you change? So we'll keep this really quick because I think we have like five minutes before we're supposed to wrap up, but I'm gonna throw it to each of you of what would you change with Comic Cons? Nice, I can start. Um, I remember from this episode, <laughs> I think is our episode two? Um, I Yes, haha, -ha, I know the things. Um, but yes, uh, one of the things definitely I feel like um, in the realm of physical and mental health for con goers, uh, I feel like there definitely needs to be more one accessibility um, for um, those that you know may not be able to walk for that long, may not be able to stand for that long, may not be able to even you know access some some of the artist alley very narrow rows um, in a wheelchair. You know, um, I feel like it should definitely. Um, be a lot more accessible in that sense and in terms of like mental also physical health is like just um more places to sit <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh more places to rest uh i feel like uh you know with cons it's go 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 let's go see this booth let's go see that but clearly we're all human uh we all need to hydrate and eat and we need a place to do those things and also to you know rest our feet um, I know there's some place, some cons have like a manga reading room. Like, that's cool. Can you have some water in here? Like, free water. <laughs> um, or, um, and I know some places have like just open rooms. But yeah, just like more plates. I know some people um, may feel too anxious or with like so many people around or may feel overwhelmed. And maybe there's just a space or multiple spaces throughout the con to be able to um, decompress and then go about their day and enjoy the rest of the con. Yeah, a chill zone. Uh, free chairs. Yeah, free chairs would be great. Um, but yeah, that's I'm only going to give that little tidbit uh, since we're wrapping up. But thank you. I was like, either anyone else? I do agree with your diversity or diversity with the um, wider spaces for those with like disabilities or in wheelchairs because it's a lot of people in not that big of a space and we're all as it is like shoulder to shoulder rubbing past. Um, it's overwhelming just kind of walking through it uh, if you're especially not used to that. Uh, and I think, yeah, wider spaces and, and chairs. Oh my gosh, chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Just a simple thing. <laughs> I mean, like, I was the one who posed this question, so I want to give space to Amanda and Shivani to, like, give what they're, um, what they like to see changed. So, I've actually never been to a con. Crazy. I know. I, um, I grew up in a really small town super far away from, like, any major cons. Um, the only one I went to was, like, this really, really small one that was in, like, the next biggest city which was like 30 miles away um and then after that it would be like 300 miles away my nearest con so super uh crazy but um I think for me so I've never even been to a con that had like panels or anything but one thing that I feel like I haven't seen is um accessibility for um anybody in the deaf community so maybe having like ASL you know I mean they probably have questions they would like to see the responses um but not being able to like you know participate in any way because you know um not everyone is going to be able to lip read especially if you're in that huge room or arena right and maybe that speaker is like a hundred feet in front of you we can't expect someone to lip read from that far away nor should they have to um so having that kind of accessibility or even having like a transcript put up onto like the screen you know if they can showcase a video or a trailer then they can definitely have someone typing up answers and responses so that people can um you know be able to see and and hear in, in that way oh that is so so good i know at for san diego's comic-con certain panels not all of them will have an asl translator but i think it's only really at, on request to be quite honest with you um definitely not something that's always always there um yeah i i kind of i'm agreeing with both of you i think there's definitely where we can make it more inclusive especially to those with disabilities i think we definitely need to highlight that a bit more um i know for myself when i've gone to a few cons um 
the Comic-Con, I think in San Diego being the biggest one I've been to, I just remember it being so overwhelming with how many people were there. And I didn't know where I was half the time. I didn't know how to get to the next room or even to the find the panels I was going to because it was just so much. And it's like sensory overload sometimes, um, even with the smaller ones. I mean, there's booths everywhere. There's people everywhere. There's celebrities <laughs> everywhere. Um, it's, it's a lot to take in. So I think, you know, Honestly, I'm kind of like, I don't think I've seen one or I noticed one. I, I'm agreeing where I think we need chill rooms or like, you know, kind of decompress yourself a little bit and go, okay, I like get my bearings back, figure out where I'm going um, and, and take a minute away from the crowd. I think that's for me, the biggest thing I would, I would love to see more of. Um, I think there was one convention I went to out in Phoenix and they had like a room and I'm not playing like the tables had just Legos on it. And I was like, cool, I can just sit here for a minute and build Legos and be away from a bit, bit of the people and the noise and the chaos. And I'm just going to sit here until I'm good to go again and, and rest and, and then go back out to it. So, yeah, I'm definitely on the the chill rooms. I yeah, because it can be really overwhelming very quickly, especially if you're not used to being around so many people. Um, yeah, chill rooms. But excellent. So I'm going to wrap us up there. Unfortunately, I swear we could go on for hours and hours with this conversation. Um, but if you'd like to hear more of this type of conversation, definitely check out um, Fandom Femmes. Um, we, I will leave the links to their Instagram. And then where can they listen to your podcast? Um, that's my cue. Uh, you can listen to our podcast. Basically, we're on every platform where there are podcasts, um, Anchor FM, Spotify, Google Podcasts, uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, we're there. Um, yeah, please feel free. Like a huge cornerstone of Fandom Femmes is building community. So please, please, please reach out to us, connect with us. We also have like a guest interest form. So if you're from a historically underrepresented community and you have something to say about fandom, um, we would love to um, have you on an episode. So please feel, fill out our form or DM us if you have any questions. We're really looking forward to talking to you. That is amazing. I love that. I love that. I guess Shivani, any last hellos, goodbyes? I just want to say thank you guys for coming. It was so awesome to be able to talk to um, such a, or just be a part of this amazing panel. Um, I love talking about my fandoms and I don't get to do it often enough unless it's with other people who, um, you know, role play or, or used to role play with me like way back in the day, which I don't get to do anymore. Um, but it's just nice to, to be a part of it and have these conversations and honestly have these conversations that are so meaningful. Um, and so important, you know, for us, for our mental health, for what we think is important. Um, it's just nice to have this representation. So thanks for letting me be a part of it. Just a perfect way to end that off right there. Um, thank you all three of you for joining me on this panel. Um, I had a really fun conversation going through fandoms and just getting to geek out all over again over what everyone has been saying all night. Um, but yes, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us. Uh, so I do want to, as we wrap up, um, just go over some resources we offer here at NAMI. So our first one is our OC warm line. Uh, so this is a free and confidential telephone service providing emotional support um, and resources to our Orange County residents. Um, it's available 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, you can call or text this number. So if you're ever feeling like you just need to chat with someone or you're curious about what mental health resources are available in your area, um, they have a huge database and can help connect you. Uh, so that number is 714-991-6412. Uh, we also have our teen and young adults program. So this Honest Hour is one of our many programs we offer specifically for our teens and young adults. Um, on our website at namioc.org, um, you can stay up to date on the latest programs and events, um, community resources, and more um, just specifically for your age group and see what's going on with face-to-face. Uh, -face. So this is a newer program we offer here at NAMI. Um, this one is amazing because it's open to those 16 and up. And it's really a chance for you to have that peer mentorship and one-on-one -on -one through, it's currently through Zoom, but you do get a little bit of that face-to-face -face, um, space with your mentor. 
And, you know, they're there to be that emotional support for you. So the conversation is guided completely with like what you want to talk about um, and they'll help connect you with resources, be there to just listen. Um, and it's a really, really great program to be a part of. So you can find that as well. We'll drop all those links in the chat for you guys to um, check out later on. Uh, with our survey, once again, your feedback really, really helps us create more programs like Honest Hour at no cost. Um, so we would love to hear how you felt about tonight's talk, um, what other um, talks you would love to see in the future. So if you guys could take just a few minutes, um, please fill out that survey. It really helps our programs. Coming up, so August, we are all about the fandoms. Um, so if you loved this conversation and want to hear more, um, we have a fun game night coming up on August 17th. So our happy hour, we're going to do fandom trivia. Um, so pretty much sky's the limit. We're going to come at you with questions from all different types of fandoms. Um, and it should be a lot, a lot of fun. And then on August 24th, kind of falling in line with this conversation, um, we're going to do a happy hour with Harry Potter and the Missing Therapist. So we're going to evaluate the Harry Potter series and look at, you know, if there was a counselor at Hogwarts, would things be different? You know, would Harry have done everything he would have done? You know, who knows? Um, but we'll be joined by Mike Schubert, who is the host and creator of Potter List Podcast. Um, where he is a mid 20 in his 20s who has never read the Harry Potter series and is going through the fandom um, with fresh eyes. Um, so it should be a really fun conversation. Um, so we hope to see you at one of our other events. And thank you guys so, so much for joining us tonight for Honest Hour. All right. I hope everyone has a great night. We will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.